Great. So we already have Nigel joining us uh, as part of our final session of the Connected Core Banking Track. Uh, and Nigel Verdon is the co-founder and CEO at Rails Bank. And he will be talking about revitalizing the core with banking as a service. Hi, Nigel. Welcome. Hi. Pleased to meet you. And thank you for the invitation to speak. You're most welcome. And we are really delighted to have you and also share your expertise and insights. Uh, with respect to our audience. So we have allot uh, allocated around 25 minutes as part of this session, and we'll reserve a few minutes at the end of this uh, session for any uh, Q&A, which might uh, come across from the audiences. And uh, all over to you. The stage is yours now. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'll just try and share my screen uh, to get that working. And there we go. Has is my share. Oh, it is fantastic. Technology working. I was, I was literally on another call a moment ago and uh, the uh, um, in the midst of the, the podcast, uh, we, we got cut off and then back in again and cut off. <laughs> so this is great. So I'm really happy. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm pleased to meet uh, all of you virtually uh, this morning. Uh, from I'm, I'm in from France today, and uh, but I'm normally based in Singapore. So please do get in contact with me via LinkedIn. If you are based in Singapore, I'll be back again in residence there in, uh, in September. So what we're talking about today is just some learnings and some thoughts on where uh, the core banking is going. And is banking as a service uh, fundamentally different than a shift in, in core banking? Uh, the the uh, Just on a an observation about how tech has changed industries and i think this is one of the challenges for the uh, for the uh, uh, financial services industry is because it's a little bit more complex and uh, and it's quite uh, a vertical stack integrated and things there's still uh, we're at the cusp i think of uh, changes industry you can see how tech it, it, companies and, and it's not just the tech it's the operations the processes uh, the uh, the contract structures and everything it's not just te technology is the enabler on these business models uh, it's like uh, Airbnb has enabled anybody to be a hotel owner where beforehand you had massive infrastructure cost uh, and go to market and everything and now it's you just put your your uh, your apartment on Airbnb and there you go you're a hotel owner uh, and the same sort of thing with data center world at AWS and, and obviously Google Cloud and and, uh, and others. And so, uh, the used to spend a fortune on getting your own data center up and it have teams running it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. AWS has virtualized that, uh, got a great business model behind it. And so it's now super easy to launch businesses and run your data center uh, outside. And also because AWS has uh, had millions of people trying to hack into it, it's probably also safer than yours as well. So all this ways of how tech has basically democratized access, given further access uh, to to people to be in control and create and do new things is is, is a fundamental thing that's happened. And this is also this it's uh, what we see where tech is in, in a fundamental thing is to move from analog based world uh, to digital native businesses. And uh, where we see uh, some parts of the financial services industry and software, and I'll come to that in a sec, is every started with like videotapes, uh, or if anybody on the call connection on this uh, conference can remember uh, cassette tapes as well, and, and uh, good old SLR uh, mirror based cameras. Uh, companies that got caught in what they, they basically took an analog product and just tried to throw some technology at it. Blockbuster uh, was an analog product, uh, never went to actually create a digital video. Uh, uh, but Netflix was the same. It was a posting DVDs around, but made digital assets and streaming and became a dominant player and Blockbuster went bust. Uh, the CD was just a digitized version of a tape or an LP. Uh, LP is vinyl uh, for, for those. And it, it created a, a better form factor uh, than the tape because tapes always stretched and a real pain in your tape recorder used to chew up your tapes for you. Uh, and, and LPs, you scratch them with a needle. 
so the, the CD was a great form factor, but it was essentially the same product. It wasn't until Apple digitized that product into a digital song, right down to a micro product. You could create your own albums. You, you, uh, people at Spotify could launch. All this type of new business model uh, could be created because the product came fundamentally digital. And we know that with the iPhone and, and, and camera world, uh, they, they've totally democratized access to cameras and made them amazing cameras too, uh, as well. And, and, and whether you're an iPhone supporter or whether you're uh, a supporter of Xiaomi or any other ma manufacturers, but the, the companies who didn't change got stuck in this digitized death zone. And Kodak, one of the most innovative companies in the world in its time, and they really, really were, uh, died. And because of that, uh, they didn't see this change. And we get to the financial services industry. The analog was the, uh, the branch. And what COVID has really shown up, and I'm not picking on HSBC here. It's just uh, just one I picked from a hat because I had the photo on the left-hand side uh, of a branch. Uh, is uh, the, the the ton of money that's been thrown into these industries, into special financial services industry, into the legacy uh, organizations, whether it's banking, insurance, wealth, whatever, uh, has been uh, that uh, the digital transformation money has all it's done is automated and made a little bit more efficient analog processes. If you look at Monzo, Chime, and others, those businesses have basically total digital businesses underneath them, the processes, the which is the onboarding, the contract structures, the engagement with customer, all these different ways, and they made a pure digital product. So it's a massive challenge, and I think, uh, and there's a Gartner paper that uh, says 30, by the 2030, 80% of legacy financial services will cease to exist. Uh, I think the challenge for some of these firms is to work out, instead of doing digital transformation projects and just automating the digital, the analog processes, uh, how do, uh, ask the fundamental question, how do we become digital? I think that's also a challenge at, at, right at the very top of the company. So I, I think only 3% of bank CEOs in the world actually have a tech background. Uh, so I think that's a, a, a big, big uh, challenge for them. And what I say is, COVID has shown us up is, say, lending in the UK. Uh, when they were trying to lend, uh, they couldn't get uh, loans out the doors fast enough because the analog process meant somebody got a PDF and had to retype that PDF into another screen. Ergo, it was a broken pro There wasn't digital process end-to-end. -end. There wasn't straight through processing. It was just a more efficient analog process. So this concept of analog digitized death send to digital native is this sort of move that uh, we think the core uh, software in financial services uh, is going to change. Uh, the core problem we see that's ended up in where core banking and core, uh, where the banking you put into uh, for, uh, the equity trading systems like Fidesa uh, and and in the corporate banking world, FIS and, uh, and others, uh, the, the, the industries all organize itself around product areas and create a career product silos. And the net effect of that is the software has evolved uh, with people like SunGuard, uh, FAS, and, and others over time to be tightly coupled to that software, to that, to that silo. And so uh, the, the original core banking platforms uh, they did this silo technology where ledgering, which is books and records, product, which is like lending, Reporting, everything's all stuck together in one stack, and that stack is is complex. Uh, it's it's vertical. It's uh, difficult to innovate on because it's uh, tightly coupled, uh, very bespoke. And the original ones took multi years deployment, and I think one of the Nordic banks is a five year project to replace their core banking system, uh, and tend to be self hosted. And the only real innovation that's gone on in core banking. Uh, software called banking platforms is the move to cloud and that just makes it more efficient so that we call that still in the digital death zone uh, it's a bit less bespoke a little bit more flexible a bit more configurable uh, but the fundamental product is still stuck together uh, so you may have a cloud implementation of a vertically integrated 
uh, software stack um, thing. So nobody from the core banking world, and I think core banking will, will come to in a second, as whether it still exists or not, I don't know. Uh, there must be a better way of how do we take the software and the technology and the processes that support financial services and put them into a digital place uh, so everybody can be digital. And I think that's the, the, the real challenge. So my personal view is core banking uh, will disappear as a software segment over the next five, 10 years, uh, perhaps sooner. Uh, because uh, the core banking is just a set of functionality that gets bundled together into a, into a vertical stack and a siloed stack, and it's called core banking just because it used to be. And there's no reason we should see the future, or the future is actually now, uh, based on what the past was. Uh, and so we don't really view from a Rails Bank perspective how we look at the world is uh, financial services are a set of so APIs and building blocks. And some of those building blocks, you can build a banking platform, you can build an insurance platform, you can build a wealth platform. But some of the fundamentals, you just put them together. You don't have this concept of a core banking platform anymore. And that's where we see the future is we believe financial services as a service platforms, uh, very much the way AWS did in the, in the, uh, and Google Cloud and others have done in the, the, the space for, uh, uh, for, for, uh, data centers. Uh, you're able to reassemble stuff, uh, together to create whatever financial services you use case you want to do. And your use case can be a bit of court, bit of banking, a, a bit of payments, a bit of cards, a bit of everything. So, and the key fundamentals behind that is decouple functionality. Those vertical stacks of ledgering, product, reporting, and, and other stuff, uh, just decouple them apart. There's no reason you need ledgering uh, for each different product. A ledger is a ledger. It's got credits, debits, and a running balance. Every single financial product in the world can be represented as a ledger by definition because it goes down to the accounting uh, underneath, uh, behind it. So decoupling functionality is a fundamental belief of what uh, financial services software looks like in the future, not core banking. API building blocks, which is what this conference is all about. Everything is about uh, best of breed Lego. If I want to build something that's a uh, commodity, why do I use a why do I redo something somebody's done that's world class? If I need a a, a lending underwriting uh, platform that does uh, lending underwriting at point of sale for uh, for, uh, for stage payments, for example, there's several people who've done that already. Why do I recreate something? I use my data, which is important, uh, to feed into that. So it makes my decisioning, but the actual decision engine is that there's a ton of them. Why why we build stuff? And it's the same sort of the car industry. Uh, if you look at a Fiat 500 uh, and Nissan Micra, they, they look different from the top, but underneath are exactly the same car. And so the car industry has got the same sort of thing because the economics actually start working when you do that. Uh, Cloud-based core banking uh, doesn't move the needle. That's why it goes to that digitized death zone area. Salesforce were amazing. Uh, what they did was create an always-on architecture. So Salesforce is always on, doesn't switch off. Uh, their competitor at the time, Siebel, uh, run by Tom Siebel, uh, you had to download it uh, and install it and things, which is no different than configuring a, a core banking on, on cloud. Uh, it's not always on. It's not always multi-tenanted uh, and things. And so there's also an argument that says, oh, financial services can't go multi-tenanted. Well, JP Morgan, I believe, runs all their, all their customer engagement stuff on Salesforce and it's multi-tenanted. So uh, somebody that size can do it. I'm sure every other bank can. So there's a concept, though, of your platform, your financial services platform should be all done architecture too. There's uh, people that I think Mark Benioff ran a wonderful campaign of no software. And the, the no software campaign was totally targeted at Tom Siebel and Siebel's CRM business. And I think Rails Bank, our mantra is no core. There is no core. It, it is a set of building blocks. Then there's open industry stacks. It's not just, this is coming back to the very first slide. It's not just tech that's enabled, say, Airbnb. It's everything else, all the legal agreements and everything. And one of the things where our big mantra is open industry stacks. So you can put our licenses in, you can put your licenses in, your scheme memberships, our scheme memberships, the stack still works. 
your contract structures, our contract structures. And that's a, a super important thing to, to where platforms and financial service platforms like Rails Bank actually do. Embedded compliance, the big issue with all core banking, whether it's the old legacy ones, cloud-based, compliance is stuck on the side. When you stick things on the side, you don't understand, uh, you, you get a very different picture and you can't do real time. And so com embedded compliance is super important to the API building blocks uh, within financial services in the future. And that's why I think and Financial has it embedded in all the transactional side. We have it embedded in all the transactional side. And that's super important to be able to build a compliant uh, and uh, fraud-free, as text as much fraud as you can, environment to be able to build these building blocks. And what that then enables is super fast and low cost deployment of products uh, and experimenting with products with customers. All these things uh, that are compliant because you've got clients bedded in, they've got the right contract structures because you've got an open stack because so you can put the right contracts in and the right licensing in. And that allows you to go to market fast. And uh, regardless if you're cloud-based on your core, you're still gonna be 12 months before you actually launched uh, you're still going to have to integrate all the payments platforms, you integrate your processor, your card issue, all those things. You shouldn't need to do that at all. That's why we built it from, from a Rails Bank perspective, is be able to get a product, a neobank, into a customer's hands in six to eight weeks. The fastest we've done it, and some other product colleagues have done similar sort of things, is from idea to Apple App Store for the neobank uh, in, in eight days. And that's because of the concepts of API building blocks, decoupling functionality, always on architecture. So as soon as you've turned, turned it on, the payments infrastructure and the banking uh, world is already connected into for you. You don't have to go make those connections. Uh, open industry stacks, so you can put your license. Those together give a, 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 a the future, we believe, of uh, of what used to be called core banking, or we just call it financial services as a service. And so the core proposition that uh, we believe in, and there's other colleagues as well uh, have businesses that do this, is that any, any startup or established brand can be a fintech and you can put financial services into your customer experience and embed it to be able to either use it from an engagement product, uh, a revenue gen product, uh, customer data product, all these different things for each service could be massively leveraged. And we're seeing a huge trend in that in the industry. But by decoupling and taking this concept of core banking away into core financial service uh, Lego, that's the way to do it. And we see this is where the, the future of finance is. And so uh, we, we're quite, uh, we, we're very firm believers on uh, the, the, the core is not here anymore. The, uh, but the, the building blocks and the Lego is the future rather than core. And so that's that's the end of my uh, conversation. If you want to uh, connect with me, I know we've got questions in a moment uh, with the, uh, uh, the compare will be hopefully coming back on screen. And uh, But uh, connect to me at Nigel Verdon on LinkedIn. I'm the only one on there, okay? And I'm uh, more than happy to continue the discussion. Awesome. Hey, dear, Rosh. Thanks a lot, Nigel, for that uh, such an amazing session. And uh, I really liked uh, some of the phrases, like you mentioned, about the core banking and how it's been evolving. And talking about financial service as a service and how the innovation in APIs is driving that transformation. And uh, also uh, aligning with the previous speakers, because we talked about the application security, we talked about the evolving landscape around the APIs when it comes to banks and as part of this API days we have a large number of audience coming from the banking space and we do have a couple of minutes left and as of now we do not have any question from the audience so I would like to take this opportunity to extend uh, some of the insights which you were sharing as part of the session and one of them is around the compliance and regulation and when we talk about the compliance and regulation do you think it still remain as the major bottleneck in terms of the evolving adoption of APIs? And if it's still uh, the major bottleneck, uh, what kind of best practices or guidance you, uh, from your own experiences, can share it from the audience? Sure. Uh, I think uh, 
uh, compliance and regulation always use excuses why not to do something uh, yeah. in the financial services industry, whereas exactly. uh, uh, the medical industry is massively regulated. Uh, putting people on the moon is massively regulated. My co-founder, there's a classic quote from the CEO of a very well-known bank uh, said to me, because we've got a banking license, we write better software. Uh, and I thought, well, banking license doesn't mean you're a great software house. Uh, my co-founder was a nuclear weapons officer on the Royal Navy and the submarines. And whoever wrote Polaris missile software didn't have a banking license. And that's probably quite critical software. So the, the, uh, there's a lot of excuse. Uh, and I think naval gazing around compliance is hard. We've got to be compliant, but there's tons of industry, energy industries has to be compliant. So what I think the challenges are is using tech in the right way and, and applying tech uh, that can help you and put the processes out of this analog way that most, most banks are actually stuck in, in legacy financial services are stuck in for, financial, for, uh, for compliance or compliance operations and look at how that can be radically changed, uh, applying tech and AI and other, other techniques. And I think Standard Chartered has been doing this, which is actually hats off to them. Uh, to see how you can actually use that to to run your compliance in a much more efficient uh, and uh, numbers generated way rather than you know, humans looking at stuff. So compliance, if it's embedded into the platform as well, so you can see every single transaction and all the links between them, uh, you're able to see, get a lot more data and you can get more insights and in real time can cut things and conceive topologies. In a platform like ourselves, we can see the whack-a-mole problem where, uh, where a bad actor is, is starts off on one side, uh, is stopped there, and then pops up somewhere else. And the, and the application of decent AI data sets and, and AI technology to looking at topologies of crime uh, are, are super important because uh, one of the things we all learn is uh, every single, uh, what do you call it, uh, criminal, has generally got a perfect identity. So they passed, they passed the, uh, the identity check, identity verification, and generally pass screening as well. It's only the, the, the idiot ones who have a record that's screenable, that, that, that they get through most of the real criminals have perfect identities. So then you've got to apply tech to look at uh, behavioral change and behavioral change of mass. And the real challenge for legacy is because the data isn't real time, a lot of it's all batch, and data isn't into a consistent way. So a customer being called A, B over here, B, B, three over here, one, two, three, four, five, there isn't consistent across all the platform. So the, the uh, what's it called, the master data records, every bank has a master data project, every financial services thing has been going on for the past 20 years and still hasn't achieved it. Uh, you've got to really figure out that first or how to map all that. Then you can start uh, really using compliance uh, and, and accelerating it and doing it positively. But I don't think it's an excuse to, to not scale. Uh, you need to localize, and that's what I mean with the industry stack. And uh, Apple solved this with the, with the uh, iPhone. The iPhone was not just as a great phone. It, it has a set of industry stacks behind it that, Instead of negotiating every mobile network operator, Apple did it all for you. And so as an app developer, you just deploy once, pay one contract, of one contract, pay 30%, and you deploy around the world. Uh, before that, you had to have every single place everywhere because Apple cracked the industry stack and localization. And that was a real innovation that the, the iPhone was. And there's no reason we can't do that in the financial services industry at all. Uh, and the telco industry is also a heavily regulated industry. So I'm a slight cynic on that because I, I, there's great ways of saying why you shouldn't do something uh, uh, because you've got a vested interest. <laughs> okay. That's, uh, that's yep. my personal yep. view on it. Yeah. I really appreciate the same, Nigel. And uh, since we are now at the end of your session, I really would like to thank you so much for your time. Really insightful session. And in case any of the audiences might have questions, they can uh, reach out to you later, either on LinkedIn or, or any of the contact details that will be there as part of the channel. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank and you. enjoy and the rest of the, the conference. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll be able to see you at the party time we have virtually. <laughs> OK, yes. Okay. I think it's at the, the wrong time of day here in, in Europe. So <laughs> it has to be a, a coffee party. OK. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you.